and fashion my heart to be a vessel worthy of you. So worthy of you. Amen. Well, uh, open your Bible with me to Philippians chapter 3. I hope you got a copy of God's Word with you there this morning. If you do, say amen. amen. All right, well, that's good to hear because uh, that's what we're here for. Amen. And uh, we're going to continue in this uh, series through Philippians this morning as we continue our focus on the unstoppable joy that Jesus gives to the heart of everyone that believes on him. And, and you know, I think that that song was especially appropriate as we turn now to the Apostle Paul's testimony of when the day in his life when everything changed. He had been convinced that he was living right until a day where he met Jesus and then God radically changed his life. And out of that encounter with Jesus, he spent the rest of his life telling anybody and everybody that he could. Uh, anytime he got a pulpit, he, he was going to use it for the glory of God. And uh, so he wanted to tell people about Jesus. And that really ought to be uh, our main motivation in life. But while I got you together here this morning, I was thinking about this passage. And I was thinking about some things that uh, some I think some truthisms, maybe you might call them uh, modern day proverbs that we, that we use. And uh, one is a familiar one. You've probably heard an expression like this. If you snooze, can you fill it in? You lose. If you snooze, you lose. All right, they're listening this far in, sweetheart. Amen. If you snooze, you lose. Another one is uh, leap before you look. Now, I have been informed that if the pastor doesn't quit leaping around in the pulpit, they might put a trap door back here somewhere. So I'm not sure if I'm going to put that one into practice or not. Uh, here's one. The, the early bird gets the worm. Now, that one's for the birds, you see, because I'm not interested in eating worms. Amen. But you get the point. Here's one that you need to know, though. We have an adage in our culture. We say, it's not, who you, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Now, that's real frustrating when you're trying to get a job, amen? If we, if we can have just a moment of, be, of being honest with each other, that, that one's kind of frustrating in the practice and the ongoing of life. But let me tell you, that is a blessing when it comes to getting to heaven, amen? It's not what you know, it's who you know, that you know the Lord Jesus. And as we come to this passage together today, I am reminded of what a blessing it is to know Jesus, if it depended on us, we'd never make it. But because we know somebody, we can make it to glory because Jesus did it all for us who believe. And I want to share with you three benefits of knowing Jesus this morning. Just in case you've forgotten, he's a good Savior. Amen. And he's worth giving your life to and giving your all to and giving him everything you've got because he gave everything he's got for you this morning. And I want to invite you to read with me in this passage here in Philippians chapter 3 as we consider God's word together and we ask God to move in our midst and to speak to our hearts today. Would you read with me here in Philippians chapter 3? And the Bible tells us, finally, my brothers. Now, folks, in case you don't know, there's a whole other chapter behind this. You know when the preacher says finally, he's just getting started. Amen. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. If you're glad to know Jesus, would you say praise God this morning? Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we, verse 3, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, 
I have more. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Verse 6, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But look at verse 7. Look at this precious verse. But whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, no, no personal goodness of my own, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Would you pray with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we, we come together in this place today, God. We just want to tell you and acknowledge your name. It is so good that sinners like ourselves, because of your grace, because of your mercy, that we can gather together and proclaim your glory and how good you are. We thank you that we can come to this time where we can be instructed in your word. God, we pray that you would put aside every other detail on our calendar and our schedule, the things that are going on in our lives today. And for these next few moments, God, would you speak and hear us, uh, help us to hear you, God. God, we believe that you have eternal business that you want to accomplish in this place today. Oh, God, would you have your way and use your word to accomplish what you attend. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. As we come to this passage together today, I want to remind you that for those of us who know Jesus, that because we know Jesus, we should run from that which is false. That we should run from that which is false. Did you hear in these first four verses, in, in the span of four verses, three times, Three times the apostle told us, watch out, watch out. Watch out for those who seek to lead you astray from Jesus. Earlier in this letter, the apostle Paul had identified a group of preachers that he said were still preaching a gospel message, a true saving gospel message. They just had wrong motivation for preaching their message and they were running Paul down to puff themselves up to add to the credibility to their resume. But he said of that first group that they were still preaching a true saving gospel message. But then we get to chapter 3. And he told us, watch out, because not everybody out there in the world is preaching a true saving message. And he wanted to tell these believers at Philippi, who were the first of his mission trip in the uh, span of Europe, as he stepped out with Silas and, and Timothy out there, that there were some who came behind him, his baby, you understand, he, his, uh, he loved him so much that he said, look, there are another group of teachers that you need to watch out for. And the Bible tells us that they were, uh, uh, scholars tell us rather, uh, that they were of that same kind of group that came behind Paul and Barnabas when they planted those churches in Galatia in modern day Turkey and they were trying to lead the believers away, telling them that it's good that you believe in Jesus, but Jesus isn't enough. Friends, they taught us something in seminary, baloney, <laughs> for a term like that. Friend, Jesus is all you need to be saved. But instead, these Judaizers, they had come behind the, the apostles who had planted this church and who had told them and instructed them in the way of salvation and in God's word. As God began to move in that area, 
The devil got to work behind them and uh, they were telling people, the, this group of false teachers were telling people that if they wanted to be saved, that they had to go back to keeping the law with its sacrifices, with its ceremonial washings, with its dietary laws, and its demands of circumcision. And Paul wrote to that church at Philippi to clarify the gospel. Because the gospel is just one generation from being lost at any given time. And they wrote and they said, Paul, we, if you don't mind, we, could you help us understand what God wants for us? Now that we have trusted in Jesus, we've got this group that's come in that's trying to confuse us. Culture is confusing us about what you want from us, what God expects of those who have trusted in him. And listen, he said, hey, look, if y'all give, give me a pulpit, I'm going to step into it. I'm going to preach Jesus to you again. I don't mind at all. Amen. And he told them about Jesus again. And he said, it's no trouble for me. And matter of fact, it is safe for you. Believers, sometimes we, we who have followed Jesus for some time, we think that through our walk with Jesus that we grow beyond the gospel. But look up at me this morning. Look up at me this morning. You never outgrow the gospel. You may grow deeper, you may understand it more, you may make better application to it, but you never outgrow the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, the gospel is what we need in our life and to come back over and over again. Some of us say, I know what the gospel is. I've been there, I've done that, I've got the t-shirt, I've checked the box. But friend, we need to come back and to continue to come back. And here's why we need to hear the gospel on a regular basis. Because we prove every day that we're still sinners. And we need to be reminded that Jesus hasn't changed. When I was in seminary, one of my pastors, uh, one of my professors rather, has grown to be a mentor in my life that I still have a relationship with. Even though he's out on the East Coast now, praise God for email, I can still talk to him. And he told us in class, he said, guys, you may show up some Sunday morning preaching God's word, preaching to those people that you, that you know as far as, you can, as anybody can know, you know that they have a relationship with Jesus. And you may say, my passage is all about the gospel this week. And you may wonder, what's the point? He said, here, let me tell you why you preach the gospel. Because everything's going good on Sunday in their life, but sometime during the week, they're going to blow it, they're going to mess up, and they're going to be dominated by guilt, by embarrassment, by shame, and they need to know that the same Jesus that saved them so many years ago is still the same Jesus today. And he has washed their sins away, and through faith in him, that they still stand forgiven. They still stand forgiven. But here's another reason why we need the gospel. We need it all the time as much as we can get it. Because the message in 2,000 years has never changed. Jude 3, I almost gave you the chapter and verse, but it's, there's no chapters in Jude, all right? Jude verse 3 tells us that the, that the gospel that they had was given to the church once and for all, that the, that the gospel, the saving message of what it takes to be a believer in Jesus Christ, to know where you're going when you pass through the doors of eternity, th that that message has never changed. And it's so important. Because the law, with its dietary laws, with all of its emphasis on circumcision, with all of its demands on works, being a good enough person to get to heaven, all of that stuff was never, ever, not ever, do you hear me, not ever intended to lead us to salvation. The law was only intended to tell us and help us to see how bad we need a Savior. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, the Bible shows us this is God's Spirit moved on Moses. They have just received the law. This, in fact, the book Deuteronomy means second law. The, the children of Israel that had wandered around in the desert for some 40 years, they needed a reminder 
of God's expectation. And so Moses, he tells Joshua and Caleb and that group that's fixing to go into the land, he tells them the law again. And listen to what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6. From the very start, you understand, of the giving of the law, he told them by inspiration of the Spirit and by prophecy of the Spirit that there was coming a day when God would circumcise the heart of all those who believe. And that is important because it tells us from the very start that the law was always meant to only be temporary. Looking forward to the Savior Jesus who would satisfy all its rules and regulations and stipulations to live a life that we could never ever live for us to be good enough in our place to satisfy. I don't know if you're with me this morning, but listen, this is good stuff that God is good. He has done it all for the believer in him, and he deserves praise because he's done it all. He's done it all. Jesus came so that we wouldn't be so worked up about outward appearance because God looks to the heart. To the heart. That's why the, fair, why the prophets would tell the people of Israel later that they needed to be circumcised in the heart. The devil so often, as even in our own lives, the devil wants to deceive you and confuse you that somehow your standing with God is based on changing your behavior. But God wants to change your heart through faith. And our, race, our relationship with God is as secure as it will ever be through our faith in Christ and in Him alone. In Him alone. Let me tell you this way. Salvation in Jesus is a complete package. There's no extra assembly required. He did it all. And God wants to change our heart. And the only way that that happens is through our faith in Jesus. The last couple of months, we've been having some real funny trouble with our van. Okay, it just started acting up. The speedometer going crazy, bouncing all over the place, driving down the road. It's misbehaving, okay? got some bad behavior. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what it was. Now, I admit I am not a mechanic, and some of that stuff they try to explain to me, it don't make any sense to me. But I took it into the mechanic, and I got this stuff going wrong with my dashboard. And he goes and he cleans something that he told me was a throttle body, and he said it was filthy. And he explained that it's the heart of combustion. That means that when you turn the key on, it goes vroom, all right? And when he cleaned this thing that was filthy, it had a sensor in it, it was making all the other bad stuff happen. And the problem stopped when the thing that was filthy got cleaned. What the law wants us to do is focus on behavior, Focus on thinking, I've got to get right before God will accept me. I've got to change, and then I can come close to Jesus. But what grace tells us is that he has done it all, and all he's looking is for you to put your faith in him, and he will cleanse the heart, and all that other stuff will get right. And he's calling us to run from that which is false so that we can enjoy grace and the freedom of grace. Here's the next thing that I want to share with you this morning. Because if you know Jesus, that ought to cause us to reorient our life with Jesus as our focus. He goes on and he tells us, if anybody else has reason for confidence, I've got more confidence in the flesh. And he gives us his resume. He lays it out. But in verses 5 and 6, he begins drilling into the uh, argument that the false teachers were making. And they had, hunt, they had put all their hope in uh, Old Testament uh, circumcision. And it was instituted as an outward sign of being a part of God's people. And circumcision in the Old Testament, it symbolized a starting place of putting your life on the path of total obedience to the law. It was just a starting place. And to practice any of it meant that you were telling God, I'm going to practice all of it in order to earn my way to heaven. And they were putting all their hope in their own 
goodness. Because they believed by doing this that they showed that they were natural born citizens of Israel. But in the New Testament, God expects us to be born again through faith in Jesus. And so Paul, when he goes through his testimony, he is sharing his experience of salvation. And listen, he thought he had it all together before he met Jesus. But one day, Jesus Christ showed up into his life. And aren't you glad that God meets you where you are? He did it for Paul. He'll do it for you. He'll do it for your friend. He'll do it for your family member. He'll do it for that co-worker. You can pray and you can trust and you can know that God still runs the sinners. Hey, he doesn't wait for us to get clean and get straight. He, he, he sent his son Jesus to die for us while we were still yet sinners, according to Romans chapter 5.8. And Paul gives his experience about how his life had been totally changed the day he met Jesus. He thought that he had been good enough to possibly earn God's love. But what we're reminded of is that we need free forgiveness and God's grace through faith in Jesus. But as we walk that out, listen, there's two spiritual ditches you need to be aware of as you try to walk out and orient your life around Jesus. The first one it's the ditch of arrogance, of spiritual arrogance. We tend to think of Paul strictly in terms of his past life and his persecution of the church, and he was aware of that. He even told us about it here. He knew he had a past. Something else he knew was that God had washed that all away through Jesus. We tend to think of him and, and his participation in the persecution of Christians but listen, before he met Jesus, Paul had convinced himself that he was a pretty good person. He convinced himself that he had all the rules down, and he was about as good as you could get. He even tells us that he was a Pharisee, and you understand that these religious leaders during Jesus' day, they invented laws beyond what the Bible said uh, in order to demonstrate and to show off how good of a person they thought they were. I just have to tell you this one. Uh, uh, of all the things that they added, they said that they, they uh, boiled it down that to do work and, uh, and to, uh, to not do work and to keep the Sabbath meant that if you had a baby and you picked that baby up to feed and to care for that baby, well, that was okay. But if you picked that baby up just to uh, get a smile and get a grin from that baby, well, that was work and that was disobedient. Can you believe that? And this is the way the human mind goes when we begin to justify ourselves. But instead, he understood that, it's, that we need Jesus. Listen, some of y'all would say, well, I've never done anything like that, preacher. But how many of us at different times in our life have said, well, at least I'm not as bad as old so-and-so. And it is easy even for those of us who have believed on Jesus to look out into the world and to, and to begin to compare ourselves with them and to say, you know what, compared to them, I'm not that bad after all. And we justify our sin and excuse our need to grow in not only our actions, but in our attitudes by comparing ourselves to others. But the thing God wants us to know this morning is the standard's not us. The standard is Jesus. But even more than that, is the assault on your confidence in Christ. That's the other ditch you need to watch out for. And I really want to spend a little bit of time uh, that I can this morning here talking to you about this. The apostle said that before he met Jesus, he was confident in his self, that in his own goodness, in his own works, and he thought that he was right before God based on how good of a person he was, how faithful to the commandments of God that he was. But then... He met Jesus and all that changed. And the thing that goes on in our life is as we begin to walk that out, we forget that Jesus is still enough. And we can begin to put our trust in things other than Jesus. That's the message Paul was telling these believers at Philippi. Don't put your trust in anything other than Jesus because he's still enough. But then these, this group of teachers came in and they wanted to get them into a trap called legalism. And you say, now preacher, I didn't go to Bible school. You're going to have to help me out with legalism. Here's what legalism is. It is when you put your trust to earn or to maintain your salvation or your fellowship with God through anything other 
than Jesus through your works, through your behavior, by adding extra rules, extra stipulations, thinking that by doing so that you can earn special status or holiness before God. Let me give you some real life examples of what that looks like in the believer's life and in the believer's heart. We begin to think this way when we think, you know what, I've been doing really good over that area of sin that I struggle with. And God must be really proud of me today. And he, I must, he must love me a little more than he did yesterday. Or we think, you know, I keep all these extra rules, these extra things, and so I must be more holy. Or you think, here's the real one that really shows us where we forget that Jesus is enough. You think, man, I blew it this week. And God must be terribly ashamed of me and embarrassed of me and not want anything to do with me. I can't even go talk to him. It's affected my prayer life. And some of us need to know the blood that Jesus shed on that cross is all we need. All we need. I came across a story of a girl that had been passed around in the adoption agency for years, but she finally settled into a home for a little while. And then that one didn't work out. And a pastor in the community heard about this little girl. He heard her story. And he said, you know, sweetheart, I've I really been praying about this, and I, I really think we need to adopt this girl. So he adopted this girl, he and his family. And he overheard her talking to her friends about in the family she was a part of before that they made numerous trips to Disney World, but they only took the biological children. And so over and over again, disappointed, left out. And so this preacher, thinking he'd be a good daddy, he just happened to arrange a speaking engagement in Florida and a trip to go down to Disney World. But he didn't have a clue how bad this little girl was fixing to misbehave. As the trip came closer, her behavior just got more wild and got worse. And he, he thought he had to say something. And he's fixing to go talk to her. And she looks at him and she says, don't, don't, just don't. I know what you're fixing to say. I don't get to go to Disney World, do I? And honest to goodness, the little girl didn't deserve to go. <laughs> but moved by grace, he looked at her and he said, Sister, is this a family trip? She said, yeah. He said, are you a part of this family? She said, yeah. He said, then you're going. And later on in the trip, the little girl walked up to him and she said, you know what, Dad? You know what, Dad? I get it. I don't get to go to Disney World because I deserve it. I get to go because I'm yours. I got more to say today, but I, I just feel moved. Where, where y'all, uh, Brian, y'all come. Some of us here today need to be reminded about how good God's grace is. Jesus did it all for you. Listen, none of us here, any of us going, going to heaven today, it's not because of anything that we've done. It's because of what Jesus Christ did for us. He lived a perfect life that none of us could live. But some of us are spending our relationship with God under the assumption that we've got to impress God with our latest report card. Listen, all he wants is your faith in Jesus. That's it. So we talk about knowing Jesus. The most important question that you could answer today is, do you know that you know that you know Jesus? Because that's the only thing that, will, that matters in determining the direction of your salvation. And God has made one way for you to be forgiven. 
And it is for you to place all your hope, every last ounce of it, in what Jesus did for you. And he will change you, and he will wash you, and he will make you a new person. The Bible tells us that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. And the old is gone, and the new has come. But for that to happen, you need to trust in Jesus. Listen, it doesn't matter how long you've come to church, and that's wonderful. We are so glad you're here. This is where sinners need to be. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter what position that you have held in a church. What matters is your position in Jesus. Have you trusted in Him? The other day, y'all keep playing, and I'm almost done this morning. I'm just trying to be obedient to the Spirit this morning. The other day, I, I heard about a a uh, sign that had a billboard that had Jesus on a cross on it. We've all seen these. It's no big deal. But it, the, the words under it is where God has brought us to today. The words under that said, it's your move. God has done all that is required for anybody to be saved. But it takes a moment of personal trust in Jesus Man, if you're here today and you're saying, you know, I, I have been trying to do the best that I could all my life, but today God has shown me that, it is, that I could never be good enough to earn His love and that I don't have to because Jesus did it for me. And today, today, right now, I want to make sure that I know Jesus. Listen, all you've got to do to start that relationship is just tell Him, God, I know I've blown it. I believe Jesus did everything that I couldn't, and today I want to receive him. And I believe that he raised from the dead for me. If you will do that, he will save you right where you're at. And then this morning, God wants you to come to express that faith publicly today. Listen, it's not to earn anything. It's not to prove anything. It's so that we can all celebrate in God's work in your life. Listen, nobody's going to think a thing about you. We're just going to rejoice in what God's done in your heart. But believer, if you're here today, could I just ask you, have you been dominated by messing up, by, by your sin, by thinking you're not quite good enough, thinking you've got something to prove with God? Listen, he proved it all. Today, if, you, if you've got something in your past that you need to lay down, you can come do it. If you need to come recommit your life, you can come do that, and Jesus will be with you today. This altar's open. Would you stand with me? And pray with me.